princess last looked out on the feast of Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel, when a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel. Bring me flesh and bring me wine, bring me pine knots hither, thou and I will see him die. When we bear them thither, page and mourn and forth they went, forth they went together, through the ruins while the lament and the bitter weather. In his master's steps he trod, where the snow they didn't it, it was in the very sod which the saint had printed. Therefore, Christian, then be sure, well for and possessing, Ye who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. <laughs> I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day in the morning. And what was in the ships of three on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day? And what was in the ships of three on Christmas Day in the morning? Savior Christ and His Lady on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I say the Christ and His Lady on Christmas Day in the morning. And all the bells on earth shall ring on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. And all the bells on earth shall ring on Christmas Day in the morning. And all the heavens and earth shall sing on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. And all the angels in heaven shall sing on Christmas Day in the morning. And let us all rejoice on it on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Then let us all rejoice on it. On Christmas Day in the morning. <clears throat> God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you display. Remember Christ our Saviour was born upon this day. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in jewelry this blessed babe was born, and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn. To which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our heavenly Father a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Jacob Marley was dead, to begin with. There was no doubt about that. He was dead as a doornail. Mind you, I, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is that's particularly dead about a doornail. I might be inclined myself to consider the coffin nail the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in a simile, and our unhallowed hands shall not disturb it. You will therefore permit me to repeat that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were partners for many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, sole administrator, sole friend, and sole mourner. Not that Scrooge himself was so terribly cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards. And above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes customers used the firm called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes not. Well, the answer to both names, it was all the same to him. There was a tight fist at hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. He was secret. Oh. Self contained. And as solitary as an oyster. Oh. Cold within him, 
froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Hard and sharp as flint, he iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to exchange conversation. No beggar implored him to bestow a trifle. No children ever asked them the time. No man or woman ever stopped to ask the way to such and such a place. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way through the crowded paths of life. Warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge was sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The city clocks had only just struck three, but it was quite dark already. The fog poured in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. The door to Scrooge's office was open, so that he could keep his eye on his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a dismal little cell beyond, was busy working. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Yeah, not bad. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. We're trying to you to be merry, you, you're poor enough. What more of you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Yeah, not bad. Don't be cross, Uncle. <coughs> That's expected me to be when I live in a world full of fools. Merry Christmas. What well, Christmas, but a time for having no money to pay bills. To find yourself a year older and not a penny richer. I could work my way. Every idiot that goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew! Let me keep Christmas in my way and you keep it in your way. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. <laughs> Much good has it ever done you. Well, there are many things from which I might derive good by which I have not profited, I dare say. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time as a good time. <laughs> a kind, charitable, charitable, forgiving, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women open their shut-up hearts and really think of those below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave. And so, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good. And I say God bless it. Bravo. Very well said, Mr. Fred, sir. One more word out of you, Bob Cratchit, and you'll celebrate Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. No wonder you don't go into Parliament. Dine with us tomorrow. Never. Why ever not? Emily would love to have you with us too. Yes. Yes, that's another thing. Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Yeah. Good afternoon. I ask nothing of you. Mm. I want nothing from you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel that I have been a part of. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I shall keep my Christmas humour to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. <laughs> a very Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and to your friend. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Fred. And the same to you and uh, Mrs. Fred, sir. Uncle. Yes, you. There's another one. My clerk, Bob Cratchit. Fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family support. Talking about a Merry Christmas. I retire to bed. Hey! 
Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these past seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh, I see. Uh, well, we have no doubt his liberality will be, um, well, kept up by his surviving partner. I am Mr. Paxton, and this is my friend and colleague, Mr. Kirby. A pleasure to meet you, sir. Uh, now, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is usually desirable to make slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. Many hundreds are in want of common necessaries, sir, and hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts. Then, are there no prisons? Uh, plenty of prisons, sir. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Union Workhouse is still in operation. They are. I wish I could say they were not. Yeah, and the poor law and the treadmill are still at full vigour. Yes, sir. Very, very busy, sir. Good. I thought for a minute something might have happened to stop them in their useful course. Uh, well, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund for the poor mm -hmm. to buy them some food, drink and means of war. What may we put you down for, sir? Nothing. <laughs> ah, I see. You wish to be anonymous. <laughs> I wish to be left alone. Since that is what you ask, that is what I wish. Hmm? I don't make myself merry at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I support the institutions <laughs> I have mentioned. They cost enough. And those who are badly off had better go there. <coughs> oh, many can't go there, sir. Now, many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. But, sir... Good afternoon, gentlemen. You'll be wanting all day to my off. Oh, uh, well, yes, if it's, uh, if it's quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient. <laughs> and it's not fair. If I was to stop you half a crown, you'd feel yourself ill-used, no doubt. But you don't see me ill-used when I pay out a day's wages for no work. Well, it's only once a year, Mr Scrooge. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Come on, come on. <coughs> Do the scarf. Oh, very well. Take the day. But be here all the earlier the next. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Yes, I will, sir. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. And a Merry Christmas. took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and, having read the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner, Marley. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of a building up the yard. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. Yeah. 
Take your money! Darkness was cheap, and Scrooge liked it. Before he shut his heavy door, he went through all the rooms of his house to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table. Nobody under the sofa. Small fire in the grate. Spoon and basin of gruel ready. Left by the housekeeper, Mrs. Dilbert. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in the closet. Or nobody in his dressing gown. Which hung with suspicious attitude against the wall. <laughs> Quite satisfied, he closed the door and double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Disorder, the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a, 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 a crumb of cheese, a, 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 yeah, a bit of underdone potato. Uh, uh, there is more of the gravy than the grave about you. <laughs> Man of a worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I, I, I do. I must, I must, but, 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 but why do spirits walk, walk the earth and why, why do you required. come to me? If every man of the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide, and if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander in the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. But I notice you, 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 you are fettered. But, but, tell me why. Where well, the chain I forged in life, I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, but of my own free will I wore it. Would you know the weight and length of the heavy coil you bear yourself? It was as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago that you have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous shame. Speak, speak fair to me. You were always a good man of business. Business? Yes, business. Mankind was my business. The common the welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, for heaven, for all my business. 
time, there's really God. Yeah, there was Hear me, love! I missed it, I missed it. I have sat invisible beside you many a day. That is no light heart of my penance. But tonight I am here to warn you. You have yet a chance of hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. <laughs> It's very kind of you, Jacob. You're always a good friend. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Ah, is, is that the chance you were talking about? It is. Well, I think I'd rather not. Without these visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Now, now, listen, can't I just take them all at once and get it over and done with? Expect the second on the next night no, at no, the same it. hour. No, the no, third no. upon the next night no, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. No, Jake, Look please. to see me please. no more. Yes, but for your own sake, remember what has passed between us. No, Jacob. Ah. Ja 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 Jacob. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste, and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat. With a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, who had sought below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Uh, whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge climbed into bed anxiously, looking all about him as he did so, and then eventually fell asleep. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that he could barely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. The chimes of a neighbouring church struck the four quarters, so he listened for the hour. into the next night. The more he thought, the more perplexed he became, oh. and the more he endeavoured not to think, the more Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Oh. Every time he resolved within himself that it was all just a dream, his mind flew back to its first position and presented itself with the same problem to be worked through. Was it a dream or not? He resolved to stay awake until the hour had passed, and seeing as he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, it was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he had sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length it broke upon his listening ear. A quarter past. A half past. A quarter to it. And the hour itself. Told to me. I am. Oh. Well, 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 who or what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Well, 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 long past? No. Your past. Well, well, 
Uh, what business do you have with me? You're welcome. Rise and walk with me. No, no, no. I, I, I am mortal. I, and I am liable to fall. Beth, at a touch of my hand, and you should be upheld in more than this. Oh. Oh, As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished also, for it was a clear, cold winter's day with snow upon the ground. I know this place. I, I was bred here. I, 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 I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? You recollect the way? Let <laughs> I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate, post and tree. Yeah. Until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, church and winding roads. <laughs> Some ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs. We called to other boys oh. in country jigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full oh. of merry music that the crisp air laughed to hear it. The jocund travellers came on, and as they did, Scrooge knew them by name. Yes, of course. Uh, that's, that's John Spencer. Uh, oh, and there's, there's little Victor Browning. Uh, hello, boys! Hello! These are but shadows of the things that have been. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's a naughty little boy, my little Oliver. <laughs> they have no consciousness of us. Why would you rejoice beyond all bands to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was his heart filled with gladness when he heard them give each other a Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways to their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done to him? What is the matter? Nothing, no, 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 nothing. Come, let us see another Christmas in this place. Scrooge's school was a mansion of dull red brick. The walls were damp and mossy, the windows broken and their gates decayed. It opened to disclose a long, bare, melancholy room. <laughs> school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still for yet another Christmas. Dear, dear brother, I'm going to bring you home, dear brother. To bring you home. Home, home. Home, little man. Yes, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He spoke so gently to me one day night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if he might come home. And he said you should, and sent me a new coach to bring you. And you are to be a man, and never come back here, dear brother. But first, we are to have the merriest time in the world. You are quite a woman, little friend. Always a delicate creature, your breath might have withered. Yes. Yes. But she had a large heart. Oh, she, she had that. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. Uh, just one child. True. Your nephew. Yes, 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 friend. Although they had but barely left the schoolroom, they suddenly found themselves in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed. Where shadowy carts and carriages battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of the real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops, but here too it was Christmas time again, for it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door. Do you know this place? Yes, I... I, I, I was apprenticed here. Your hold there, Master Wilkins! Master Scrooge! Oh, it's Fezziwig. Oh, bless his heart, it's Fezziwig. He's, he's alive again. Oh, there's, there's Dick Wilkins. Dick, he, he was very much attached to me, you know he was. Good friend. No more work tonight, boys. It's Christmas Eve. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Right away, Mr. Fezziwig. Here it was, Mr. Fezziwig. We'll have it clear in a jiffy, sir. 
It's time for the Christmas party, my friend. Oh, yes, indeed. And I am hoping and praying that Abigail Langley will be here tonight. Do you think you'll win her heart this year, my friend? Well, if not, I think I shall give up. Third time lucky, eh, Ebenezer? Assistance pays off. And what about you? Will you be asking Mary questions to dance? You know she has a soft spot for you. No, I think you can guess where my interests lie. Ah, yes, of course. Old Fezziwick's niece, the fair Belle. She indeed. If I could win her heart, I'd never let her go. What, not even for the money in Fezziwick Bank? Why not for even all the money in the world? <laughs> That's the trick, lads! Clear away and we'll have plenty of room here! Clear away? There's nothing they wouldn't clear away or couldn't clear away. It was Mr. Mrs. Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floors were swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire and the warehouse was as dry, bright, snug and warm a ballroom as you could possibly wish to see upon a winter's night. Along with Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig, in came all the young men and women employed in the business. In they all came. One after another. Anyhow and everyhow. There were dances and there were forfeits and there were more dances and there was cake. And there was a great piece of cold roast and there was a great piece of cold boiled. And there were lots of mince pies and plenty of mulled wine and beer. <laughs> Is everyone having fun, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> well, anyone found to be otherwise, we made to sing and dance on their own for the delight of the rest of us. <laughs> Speaking of dancing, it's time for that special dance of the evening. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please take your places. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Over here. <laughs> here it is, Sir Roger Dick Cumberly. <laughs>
He was not alone. Sat opposite this desk was a fair young girl in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced you, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to do. No just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? The golden one. This is the even handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing which it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you, am I? contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. Until in good season we could improve our wealthy fortune by our patient industry. You are changed, Ebenezer, when the contract was made. You were another man. But what I was was a foolish boy, naive to the harsh ways of this world. Your own feeling tells you that you are not what you are. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. Yes. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it. We can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. An altered spirit in another atmosphere of life. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heaven knows when I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be, but can even I believe that if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who weighs everything by gain. Heaven. 
And so, Ebenezer, I release you with a full heart for the love of the man that you once were. May, if our love meant anything to you, have pain in this. But I imagine only for a very brief time. Then you'll dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. in the life we've chosen. Goodbye, Ebenezer. <laughs> Go after her. Run after her, you, you, you stupid boy! Don't, don't let her go! Don't let her go! No! 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 Oh, spirit! Why do you continue to put me through so much torment? I told you, be the shadows of the things that have been. No, hold me no more, hold me no more, take me home! Bell Lady Mallows and has three beautiful children. Spirit, why do you delight to torment me? You think they are what they are. Do not blame me. Please, just go. Leave me home in my company. Please, 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 please have mercy. Leave me, leave me, leave me. Oh. Oh. Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, oh. and further of being in his own bedroom. He sank into a heavy sleep. Oh. Compulsion, and I, I learned a great deal. If you have all to teach me, then, then, then please show me. Touch my robe. Hide, Martha, hide! <laughs> <laughs> 
Here we are, Tim. <laughs> hello, 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 everyone. How are we all? Hello. Why? Where is that, Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Surprise, Father! <laughs> <laughs> right, go get your hands washed for dinner, please. Oh, yeah. oh you come with me, Tim? Yes, Martha. And then can I do a little bit of pudding singing in the copper? If Martha says you can. Of course you can, Tim. Off you go. <laughs> it's our little Tim today, Robert. Oh, as good as gold and better, my dear. You know, somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. He comes out with the strangest things you ever heard. You know, he told me today, walking home, that he hoped people saw him in the church because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant for them upon Christmas Day to remember who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. This is hard. Here, you make me cry in front of the children. Get away with you. Is the book ready, Mother? Is it? Is it? Yes, it is. We've all been preparing the dinner while you and your father have been at church. Now, sit yourself down, Martha. Give me a hand. Come along, children. Let's all enjoy this feast. Thank you to all the chefs. Now, come on, and I'll serve up, and then we can eat up before it gets cold. Come on, then, children. <laughs> it's uh, quite a meagre bird for, su for such a, a large family. Well, perhaps if Bob had an extra few pennies in his wages every week, they could afford a bigger goose. The cooked bird was indeed very modest. But... The few pieces of meat that each of them had on their plates were eked out by the apple sauce. And the mashed potato and the vegetables and the gravy. So that all combined to appear sufficient dinner for the, each member of the family. Once they had cleaned their plates to the point where they barely needed washing up. Everyone had had enough. And the youngest Cratchits, in particular, were seeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. What a feast that was, Paula. Fit for a king. Yes, it was indeed, Tim. Thank you, Mother. Yes, oh, thank, thank you, you Mother. Mother. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Because... It's time for pudding! Oh, yes, sit here <laughs> away the plates, come on! There suddenly was a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. It smelled like a washing day. Back to the clock. It smelled like an eating house. And a pastry cooks next door to each other, with a laundress is next door to that. That was the pudding. Within half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered flushed and smiling proudly, with a pudding that resembled... A speckled cannonball, hard and firm, blazing with ignited brandy and adorned with Christmas holly stuck into the top. What a wonderful pudding, my dear. The best you've baked since we were married. <laughs> oh, you say that every year, Robert. Thank <laughs> you, Mother, it's magnificent. Oh, well, I'm glad it's come out all right. It's a wet off my mind, I'll tell you. Oh, for at least another 12 months. <laughs> I wish we could eat it all again tomorrow. Oh, so do I. I'd eat it all again right now if I could. <laughs> so would we all. But that is what makes Christmas so special. At last, the dinner was done. The cloth was cleared, the hearth was swept, and the fire made up. The compound being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were placed on the table and a shovel full of chestnuts in the fire. Then the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one. And then Bob proposed a toast. A Merry Christmas, my dears. God bless us. God, God bless, bless us. us. God bless us. <laughs> right then, it's time for games. Come yes. along, children. Come Let's go. Of course you can choose the first game, Tim. Come along, son. Come on, everyone. You can choose one. Tell me, Spirit. Will Tiny Tim live? 
I see an empty chair in the chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Please spin it. Please spin it. If these Say shadows it. remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him. No, 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 no. What then? Please say, please say, please say. If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> Will you decide what men shall live and what men shall die? Maybe that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well done, Tim. Come on, Tim. Come on, Tim. Come on, Tim. Have a rest. That's it, sir. Right. Has everybody got full glasses? Hmm? Right. I hope so. Raise them high, for I give you a toast. Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Oh, she was there. I'll give him a piece of my mind to feast upon and hope you have a good appetite for it. The children, Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day and we, we drink to an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man such as Mr Scrooge. Oh, you know he is, Robert. No one knows better than you, poor fellow. Oh. My dear, Christmas Day, hmm? I will drink to his health. For your sake and the days, not for his. A very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to Mr. Scrooge. He's all very happy and very merry, I have no doubt. <clears throat> Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. Uh, well, at least Bob's shown some dedication and, and, and gratitude. After all, it's because he's got his position at my accounting house that... Now then, children, I must tell you, I have my eye on a possible situation but our young Peter here, which, if he was lucky enough to secure, would bring in a full five and sixpence weekly. Oh, tell us more, Robert. I shall tell you all about it later, my dear. Now, we shall, we can but hope that he will be lucky enough to secure the position. We all know what those extra few pennies will mean to this family. <laughs> but on that happy possibility, it's time for, to, for Tim to sing his Christmas carol. Come along, Tim, whenever you're ready, son. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I saw three ships come sailing in. Christmas day in the morning and what was in those ships all three on Christmas day on Christmas day and what was in those ships all three on Christmas day in the morning You've never taken the time or trouble to learn this but the elf is not a mother is a poor apprentice that had known She works for so many hours that she's exhausted daily and her personal Christmas being as it is a holiday's world. She will lay a bed for a good long rest. Well deserved it is too. But yes, but, but a hard work has its rewards, doesn't it? If Peter is successful in his machine of employment that your clerk spoke of, he will understand that his mere pocket change to you. But see how much it would mean to this loving family. Observe the what they have, but how much they make of it. Their clothes are, and their shoes are, far from waterproof. Their meals are small, and their comforts few, but they are happy! <laughs> Grateful, pleased with and for one another, and contented with the time they spend together. What do you do with your time, Ebenezer Scrooge? You count your money. You repel all offerings of companionship. Deny charity, and you exploit your poor, dedicated club. And what does he do? 
proposes a toast to you, and you have the temerity to think that he was right to do so, it is clear you still have much left to learn. Ebenezer Scrooge.